An industrious man, a weaver in the little town of North Berwick, Scotland, was married to a beautiful woman who, after bearing two or three children, was so unfortunate as to die during the birth of a fourth child. The infant was saved, but the mother had expired in convulsions, and as she was much disfigured after death, it became an opinion among her gossips that, from some neglect of those who ought to have watched the sick woman, she must have been carried off by the elves, and this ghastly corpse substituted in the place of the body. The widower paid little attention to these rumours, and after bitterly lamenting his wife for a year of mourning, began to think on the prudence of forming a new marriage, which, to a poor artisan with so young a family, and without the assistance of a housewife, was almost a matter of necessity. He readily found a neighbour with whose good looks he was satisfied, while her character for temper seemed to warrant her good usage of his children. He proposed himself and was accepted, and carried the names of the parties to the clergyman, called, I believe, Mr Matthew Reed, for the due proclamation of bans. As the man had really loved his late partner, it is likely that this proposed decisive alteration of his condition brought back many reflections concerning the period of their union, and with these recalled the extraordinary rumours which were afloat at the time of her decease, so that the whole together forced upon him the following lively dream. As he lay in his bed, awake as he thought, he beheld, at the ghostly hour of midnight, the figure of a female dressed in white, who entered his hut, stood by the side of his bed, and appeared to him the very likeness of his late wife. He conjured her to speak, and with astonishment heard her say that she was not dead, but the unwilling captives of the good neighbours, or fairies. She told him that, if all the love which he once had for her was not entirely gone, an opportunity still remained of recovering her, or winning her back, as it was usually termed, from the comfortless realms of Elfland. She charged him, on a certain day of the ensuing week, that he should convene the most respectable housekeepers in the town, with the clergyman at their head, and should disinter the coffin in which she was supposed to have been buried. The clergyman is to recite certain prayers upon which, said the apparition, I will start from the coffin and fly with great speed round the church, and you must have the fleetest runner of the parish, naming a particular man famed for swiftness, to pursue me. And such a one, the smith, renowned for his strength, to hold me fast after I am overtaken. And in that case I shall, by the prayers of the church and the efforts of my loving husband and neighbours, again recover my station in human society. In the morning the poor widower was distressed with the recollection of this dream, but, ashamed and puzzled, took no measures in consequence. A second night the visitation was again repeated. On the third night she appeared with a sorrowful and displeased countenance, upbraided him with want of love and affection, and conjured him, for the last time, to attend to her instructions, which, if he now neglected, she would never have power to visit earth or communicate with him again. In order to convince him that there was no delusion, he saw in his dream that she took up the child at whose birth she had died and gave it suck. She spilled also a drop or two of her milk on the poor man's bedclothes, as if to assure him of the reality of the vision. The next morning, the terrified widower carried a statement of his perplexity to Mr Matthew Reed, the clergyman. This reverend person, besides being an excellent divine in other respects, was at the same time a man of sagacity, who understood the human passions. He did not attempt to combat the reality of the vision which had thrown his parishioner into this tribulation, but he contended it could only be an illusion of the devil. He explained to the widower that no created being could have the right or power to imprison or detain the soul of a Christian, conjured him not to believe that his wife was otherwise disposed of than according to God's pleasure, assured him that Protestant doctrine utterly denies the existence of any middle state in the world to come, and explained to him that he, as a clergyman of the Church of Scotland, neither could nor dared authorise opening graves or using the intervention of prayer to sanction rites of a suspicious character. The poor man, confounded and perplexed by various feelings, asked his pastor what he should do. I will give you my best advice, said the clergyman. Get your new bride's consent to be married tomorrow or today if you can. I will take it on me to dispense with the rest of the bands or proclaim them three times in one day. You will have a new wife, and if you think of the former, it will be only as of one from whom death has separated you and for whom you may have thoughts of affection and sorrow, but as a saint in heaven and not as a prisoner in Elfland. The advice was taken, and the perplexed widower had no more visitations from his former spouse. 
she had probably left him in disgust at his perfidy.